Thanks, everybody. I know we're a couple of hours out of lunch, so people are probably starting to fade. But I will try to, uh, try to keep this relatively quick, but also some data here, because I think it's an important subject to cover. Um, as I mentioned at the, uh, the introduction, I'm, I'm Jonathan Tower, and the managing partner of a fund called Catapult. We're based in Silicon Valley. I think what makes this quite different is one of the only firms based in Silicon Valley that doesn't actually invest in Silicon Valley. Um, but what we like to do is start the presentation off, talk a little bit about the agenda. We'll cover a bit about who we are. We'll then jump into the four macro trends and themes in venture, but also broadly in technology. Uh, I'll then cover some common misperceptions that U.S. investors and I would say EU VC investors have about startups coming out of emerging tech ecosystems such as Istanbul. We'll talk about the opportunities globally in venture. Uh, I'll then sort of jump a little bit about some of the challenges that are happening right now in Silicon Valley and then wrap it up with some of my tips and, and expectations for how emerging tech ecosystems can seize the moment. And I think the moment is quite considerable. Um, I like to start the presentation off with a quote from Peter Thiel, who I'm sure you all know is a, a great investor and also a great founder. And he said this on a stage a couple of years ago. He said that he felt that 20 years ago there was an 80% chance that the next wave of unicorns would come from within about a 50 mile radius of Silicon Valley. He now thinks there's about an 80% chance that they will come from well outside of the Bay Area. Uh, we obviously agree with that thesis and we built a fund around that thesis. So we're a global seed stage platform. We are really focused on serving the best entrepreneurs from emerging tech hubs outside of Silicon Valley that are building transformational companies attacking billion dollar markets that are ripe for disruption. We are an experienced venture team. We spun out of very well known Silicon Valley venture firms. We've invested in more than 271 companies and put about $660 million to work. We've been involved in about 11 unicorns who are very well known for our early bets in companies like Dollar Shave Club, which obviously was a billion dollar exit to Unilever a couple of years ago. We're also an investor in Jet.com, which was a $3.5 billion outcome to Walmart. But we're also in nine other companies that are now unicorns, Gusto, Cabbage, Zenefits, Cabify, Hippo, just to name a few. We really formed the fund a couple of years ago to leverage our deep venture experience, investing in more than 15 years in, in Silicon Valley, uh, but to really focus on predominantly tier two markets outside of the valley that are, um, have much lower valuations, as you know, lower cost of operations, and where historically, have been undercapitalized when you compare it to Silicon Valley. Uh, we've realized about 4.5x returns across three core sectors. Where we've invested, we've done a heavy amount of investing in consumer. That explains our bets in companies like Casper, and as I mentioned, Dollar Shave Club, Retail Me Not. We've also invested heavily in the enterprise space, services, software, infrastructure. That explains Zenefits, Candler, Sojourn, and also in deep tech, which is a bit of a catch-all but encompasses a lot of our investments in AI, machine learning, IoT, robotics, things of that nature. We don't invest in any life sciences at the time. We also don't chase some of the more trendy sectors such as cryptocurrencies and cannabis and esports and gaming. Not that there aren't great opportunities there, it's just not thematic for us as a fund. We've returned more than a billion dollars to our limited partners, uh, and we've invested really across the globe from San, San Francisco to Singapore, uh, and we've delivered, as I mentioned, multiple unicorn exits. And I think what's also important is more than 50 exits to really the who's who of the technology ecosystem. So we've sold companies to IBM, to Yahoo, to WeWork, a variety of other companies in between. And I think what's also important for us as a fund is we've worked really with all the tier one venture firms that you could imagine. And that's a very important part of the puzzle as you think of helping companies coming out of emerging tech ecosystems to achieve in global scale. Uh, very often, we were the first check in lots of companies, especially these on the left-hand side, that went on to raise capital from the Andreessen's, the Red Points, the benchmarks of the world. And that first check provides a great deal of validation when you can leverage a deep footprint with these investors. And I think the reason is because at the end of the day, venture capital is a relationship business. VCs want to work with other VCs they know and they like and they trust, and providing that feeder fund for these top-tier brands is a critical part of how we interact with the ecosystem. So let's talk a bit about the four macro trends that was both a big impetus for us as we built the fund, but also I think is changing the dynamics of venture and of technology today. I think we can summarize them as follows. There's been a glut of capital in the valley in the last 10 years, an overabundance, I would say, of new funds and new platforms. 
I said the second theme is a really exciting theme, which is one around the decentralization of startup growth and startup development, or the remote workforce revolution, as it's commonly called in the media. Um, sorry about that. Let me go back. The third theme is really the rise of these tier two tech ecosystems. Uh, and then the fourth is really something that I would like to call sort of the changing of the guard, how the mature venture firms that we all know are evolving as businesses as they raise larger and larger funds and have heavily pulled out of seed stage investing. So let's talk about them one at a time. So just to give you a metric, uh, about 10 years ago, there was about 25 or 35 sort of seed stage funds operating in Silicon Valley. There are now more than 500. That's a 20x increase in 10 years. And so what that's causing is a great deal of capital pouring into a fairly small ecosystem, and that's, that's fundamentally changing the business. But what's interesting about venture, as you all know, is that it's fundamentally a power law distribution business, where a couple of big returns end up driving the fund and makes up for a lot of companies that were not successful. And as you can imagine, there's a virtuous cycle here. The best entrepreneurs tend to want to work with the best funds. Those best funds then have great successes and great outcomes, which then attract the next generation of great entrepreneurs. And unfortunately for LPs, if there's any LPs in the audience, you very often get shut out of accessing the, venture, the best venture firms in the business. And the best venture firms in the business tend to generate the lion's share of outcomes in the asset class. And that's been consistent through generations of venture. And so our conclusion is that if you are an LP and you want to invest in the asset class and garner the best returns, you really need to be in those top tier funds or firms that have a history of investing alongside those funds in the best deals in the ecosystem. The second theme is around this decentralization theme we've had for a while, which I think is super interesting and we're seeing it accelerate. And what I mean by that is I had a company in my office recently who pitched us whose CEO sat in Seattle, all their development was in the Ukraine, they had a call center in Kansas City and sales and marketing in New York. So you ask yourself, where do you exist as a company, right? I mean, you, you sort of are a virtual enterprise. And this is very exciting for CEOs because every startup CEO is going to say to me in one form of, I want to find the best people wherever they exist in the world. If the best engineers on the planet for what I'm trying to do are in Istanbul, I'm going to keep them in Istanbul because it's a lot less expensive to keep them here and keep the team intact here than uproot them, move them to Silicon Valley, and 10x my costs basically overnight. So it's really changing how we grow businesses, and fundamentally venture capital has got to keep pace with that. So ultimately, geography is not as important as it once was, which is really interesting and exciting. And so I would make the case that 20 years ago, if you were a startup, and you wanted to achieve global scale, you kind of needed to be in Silicon Valley or maybe outside of Boston or maybe one or two other tech hubs if you wanted to access those resources. That is changing dramatically. Uh, but still, if you are a startup coming out of a smaller ecosystem, there are some significant challenges in getting attention, getting resources, and access to capital and attention. Um, and the top funds typically don't invest in geographies that they don't spend a lot of time in if they don't have a local partner that they've worked with many, many times in the past. So the conclusion we've reached is that entrepreneurs really need to access Silicon Valley whether they like it or not. Most of the capital in venture is still deployed in Silicon Valley. Most of the great strategic partners are in Silicon Valley. So it's very important that your roads lead through that ecosystem at some point in your evolution. And that often means having another venture capitalist on your cap table that can provide that bridge to Silicon Valley. As we talk about the third theme, it's one of this rise of tech to ecosystems. You've heard a lot about that today, and that's, that's super interesting. And you're really seeing a lot of these ecosystems catch up fairly quickly with Silicon Valley. And so when you look at any of them, I think what you find is some commonalities. One of the commonalities is of many of those ecosystems have a lot of the same things that made Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley 50 or 60 years ago. Great talent, access to great technical uni universities and institutions, great corporate partners, tech savvy population, quality of life, all the things that you look for in an ecosystem. But in many of these cases, the venture capital ecosystem there is fairly immature. Local VCs, regional VCs, angels, they're all very, very important. But it's also important uh, and important to understand that many of them don't have a very deep footprint outside of that ecosystem. So when it comes time for that startup to scale, that's where challenges arise. And as I said, a lot of local investors 
Ultimately, you want to bring in a VC from outside the ecosystem to price the next round, to lead the next round, to provide that validation and that halo effect for the company. And without that capital, we tend to find that startups coming out of these smaller markets tend to die on the vine. They, they raise capital locally, they sort of pass the hat, they get to a point of some level of scale, but they're not at a level of scale where a US VC is gonna take a big interest in them in the next round, and then the company struggles to really scale beyond that. So the conclusion is that these tech hubs really need to support of, of US-based firms, ideally, that have that deep footprint with the Valley to provide that bridge that can later attract their peer investors in follow-on rounds. And as I said before, the fourth theme is really this pullback that we've seen from the top brands. They've raised, excuse me, larger and larger funds, and as they've done so, they pretty much pull back from a lot of seed stage investing. A lot of this is because it just doesn't scale. It's very hard to write a $100,000 check in an ecosystem like Istanbul if you're managing a $2 billion fund. There's also other market signaling risk effects as well that they have to think of. And so the top firms rarely invest outside of their core geographies if they don't have another partner with whom they can collaborate. And so the conclusion we've drawn is that these funds still need great companies. And they still believe that great companies are gonna come from these emerging markets and these emerging tech ecosystems, but they have to find a way to have a feeder fund system to do that. So what are the common misperceptions that we hear about companies coming out of these markets? And again, these are misperceptions. Some are more accurate than others. Some are more fair. Others are a little bit unfair. And some of them are changing very rapidly. I think one thing that we hear in Silicon Valley from other investors when they think about startups coming out of these emerging markets, they think, well, they think too small. They're not thinking globally. They may be focusing on a business that might be really successful in Turkey, but it's not really gonna go outside of Turkey. It's not something that's gonna be palatable to global consumers or global enterprise. And that's one thing that you do hear quite a bit. I think it's changing. Um, the second misperception is that there are a lot of Me Too companies. A lot of knockoffs of things that have worked really well in the US that you're now seeing entrepreneurs try to replicate in Spain, in Portugal, in other parts of the world. You know, the, the Airbnb of Brazil or the Uber of whatever. And, and, and that means that there's not a lot of innovation coming from these entrepreneurs. Again, I think that's changing, but it has been a, a common misperception among investors. I think the third misperception is that talent is not strong enough and that the best engineers, the best operators are still in Silicon Valley. I think I can tell you honestly that's not true just by looking at the data because if you look at the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, many of them were not from Silicon Valley originally. They came to Silicon Valley because they felt that's where the opportunities were. Uh, and so clearly they're coming from other markets, not just from Silicon Valley. So that is clearly not true, but it does persist. I think the fourth thing is one of the sense that the work ethic may not be as strong. There isn't a startup culture that Silicon Valley has built, that sense of I eat, breathe, and sleep startups 24-7 and that maybe in other markets people aren't quite as, as gritty. Uh, that's changing, although there's some markets that still struggle to build a startup culture, for sure. And then I think the fifth thing is more tricky, and it is true, there are a lot of disparities in the regulatory frameworks and environments of a lot of these smaller markets, whether it's bankruptcy law or labor law or creating structures to incentivize your employees through stock options. There are a lot of disparities across these ecosystems and that does give investors pause that they're not gonna have quite the same legal protections and legal potential in those markets. But again, if you look at what's happening just in France alone in the last couple of years with Macron, you're really seeing an ecosystem where 10 years ago many VCs just would not invest in France because of the labor laws. Now you're seeing VCs not only invest in France, but Paris is one of the hottest ecosystems in the EU right now. So the conclusion is that these are long-held misperceptions, but they are changing quite dramatically, and a number of big exits have a way of really strengthening and speeding up that acceleration. So the global marketplace, I think, is pretty, pretty significant. We think we are in the second or third inning of what is clearly a global technology innovation boom. It is affecting every vertical on the planet. And I think what is also important to understand is that this is no longer a Silicon Valley phenomenon. Unicorns are coming from all over the world. And I think what's also dramatic, and this is perhaps my favorite slide in the deck, is if you see the rate of that change, it is pretty astonishing. In less than five years, uh, five years ago I should say, 75% of all the unicorns on the planet were US born and bred companies. That is now flipped in less than five years to less than 25% today. And that's not all China, it is all over the world. And what we did was, we did a study 
over the last 10 years of 236 unicorn companies. And not surprisingly, over the last 10 years, about a third came from Silicon Valley, 50, 55% came from the US broadly. But when we overlaid it with where capital had been deployed in that same time frame, you see the issue, which is an over-indexing of capital to a couple of core geographies at the expense of other geographies. And what the impact is in Silicon Valley is pretty dramatic. So apples to apples comparison, if I were to invest in a seed stage startup today in Silicon Valley and found an identical startup in virtually any other ecosystem, I'm going to pay three or four times the valuation just because they're in the valley. Now, that's a generalization, but it is something we see consistently. Uh, what is also consistent is the fact that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these companies are far more expensive to operate in these smaller markets. And that also drives, significantly drives down venture returns. So the challenge of Silicon Valley, I'll kind of run through very quickly because I think you're familiar with them. You've all heard of some of the issues around the Me Too movement, some of the issues around corporate governance with what happened at Uber a couple of years ago, what happens with WeWork last summer. This has been an issue in the Valley we talk about. We're also entering an unclear regulatory environment. There's a lot of talk about breaking up Facebook or breaking up Google. So there's a lot of concern about what that means for the future of tech in the Valley. Um, there's also been a social narrative that has not been terribly uh, favorable to the Valley as people talk about the Valley being out of touch, the Valley being overpriced, the housing crisis, all these other issues that are certainly top of mind if you're a Valley investor. But also I think what's very important, and this is systemically a difference, is the emergence of these other tech hubs and their strength around core areas of technology. Now what I mean by that is if you talk about AI, and if you're a serious investor in AI, you have to be investing in Toronto and Pittsburgh as well, because some of the best engineers on the planet in these areas are actually not in Silicon Valley. They're in markets like Toronto and AI. If you are an investor in cybersecurity, I would venture to guess that the best engineers in cybersecurity are probably in Israel today. And so there are now ecosystems developing competitive advantages around core areas of technology that is not in Silicon Valley. And that's, that's a fairly dramatic change. So I think the net net here is we think the 60 year dominance of Silicon Valley is on the wane. It's not going anywhere. It's still a great ecosystem, but it is a great opportunity for emerging tech ecosystems to catch up very quickly with where Silicon Valley has been for 50 years. So how can you do that? Um, I think you know, clearly the speed of change has been fairly unprecedented. We're in a post-Brexit, post-Trump world, and that has distracted the US and distracted the EU, I mean the, the UK, and that has also created opportunities for other ecosystems to really catch up in terms of the regulatory environment, uh, a number of other legal frameworks to really become on parity with what the US has been able to do for a long time. Uh, I think also it's clearly one where you have to have all stakeholders engaged. It's not enough to spin up a venture fund in a small ecosystem and expect that's going to be the catalyst to getting that ecosystem on the map. It takes government, accelerators, incubators, corporate partners, strategic partners, everybody working together on building this. Um, I think obviously you've got to think globally day one, even though some countries are very, very small, they have to get out of that small thinking box and say there's no reason why a company is coming out of a small market, a Portugal, uh, cannot be global players and compete head to head with all the best companies coming out of Silicon Valley. As I said before, find ways to develop category leadership. What is unique to Turkey? that it can develop a strength around technology and be the best in the world at. That's a huge advantage if you can do that. And then take the long view. This is not going to happen overnight. This is a multi-year, maybe multi-decade process to get there. But I think the investment will enormously pay off. And, and I would say ultimately, and I'll conclude with saying this is one of the best times to be investing in technology. It's one of the best times to be an entrepreneur. And I think this is a great opportunity for countries like Turkey to really pull your stakeholders together and invest in your technology infrastructure and ecosystem because ultimately you're betting on yourself and I think it's a great bet with a great outcome. And I thank you for your time.